gentlemen, our guest today is none other than Ben Swan of Truth in Media, truthinmedia.com. We're excited today to be discussing ISE.media, his new project, new platform, a lot of exciting stuff he's got going on. But before we even get to this great journalist, I, I have to you know, give a little bit about our personal background and why I'm excited for this conversation, because I first met Ben Swan when he was doing a uh, mainstream Fox News affiliate and his story just as a as a so as something that encapsulates so many lessons is one that it, at least everybody who cares about journalism or freedom should, needs to know that he was working up through the mainstream media chain was a successful reporter with a Fox affiliate out of Cincinnati and then Ron Paul came along and when Ben Swan was confronted with a new truth he decided to tell the truth instead of going along with the mainstream media narrative and, yeah, well, yeah, the predictable consequences, right? Cost him his job. It's been an interesting journey to be along with since then. I've had the honor of interviewing him a number of times, and I'm especially honored to get to interview him now as he's established in his independent media career, taking it to a new level, but especially right now in this era of coronaphobia. So, you know, a part of this is just, Ben, are we... We're not the only crazy ones in America right now, are we? Like, this is, and, and just sort of like, yeah, there are a lot of people who are seeing past the propaganda of the coronavirus right now. But Ben Swan recently put out a video criticizing mask policy. And I, I mean, I, I don't even want to misrepresent it saying that, really just scientifically, very objectively pointing out that the mask policies are not backed up by science, citing three studies. I shared the video. I went back to share it again, and it was gone off YouTube. Why, why would that happen, Ben? Yeah, Adam, great to talk to you. So it's real simple as to why that's happening. It's happening because Facebook has this system that they've created of fact checkers who are don't work for Facebook. They're not accountable to Facebook. They're called independent fact checkers. And essentially, these are, are uh, you know these quasi journalists who essentially work for organizations, and their single job is to go around and to squash any kind of dissent on social media. And so they kill stories on Facebook. They label them partly false, which is a very strange label to give something, right? Partly false, because because what they'll do is they'll take any like little uh, misuse of grammar, even uh, as a quick for example. It wasn't even my story, but there was a story done recently by a group. Um, that essentially was was showing the BLM group and where the money that's donated to BLM goes, right? And they essentially were showing it goes to a, an organization called Act Blue, and Act Blue's number one recipient of donations is the Biden for President campaign. And they were labeled as a false information and partly false stories. And of course, when that happens, they put a big slate over your screen so people can't see it. Independent fact checkers have found this is not true. Here's why, see why. And the see why was because they had said that the donations go to Act Blue. And they said, well, that's not true. It goes through Act Blue and then on. Now, come on. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make the story false. It doesn't change the context of the story. But what you're doing is you're looking for any way you can to try to label something as false or partly yeah, true yeah, to discredit it. To be fair about that story in particular, there were a lot of people who were misrepresenting BLM, saying that BLM was tricking people to donate to Joe Biden, yeah. making that leap where that's not exactly accurate. That's sure. there's there's an organizational association. But I saw this tactic first used against a Ron Paul article. And it was the mm -hmm. one that, and it was like I, I was so proud of this moment for myself as a journalist that I did a podcast February 1st called The Coronavirus Hoax. He had a, a column by that same name, March 1st, and that was the one you saw getting shared all over Facebook with, like, fact-checking. And, and I read the fact-checking, and I was like, uh, mm, yeah. no, that's – you're arguing interpretation and faulty numbers. And right. It's, it's just, you, you're, are, are, but even then, like, it's, it's, always, it's always like it's, it's, it's a double-level attack with so many false authority things like this where it's, it's almost a diversion. Like if you're arguing, is Ron Paul correct about these facts? You're missing the point of why are you censoring in the first place? Don't people have the right to be wrong and to correct each other? And right. Let the marketplace of ideas take effect? Well, what's really interesting about that, and, and I absolutely believe, by the way, that people do have the right to be wrong. 
you have the right to say things that are untrue. Now, what's funny about that is Mark Zuckerberg makes that argument when it comes to selling political ads. He says that he's not going to fact check any political ads because he says politicians have the right to lie and people have the right to find out for themselves if it's true or not. So why would you extend that to politicians and not to anybody else? Because what you're really saying then is that the most powerful people in society have the right to lie. The people with the most advantage have the right to lie, but nobody else has the right not only to lie, but to even get information wrong. And as a journalist, you know, there's lots of times when you're covering a story and over time, new information comes forward that doesn't make the story untrue, but it refines it, it shapes it, it changes the way you view a story. It changes the details of that story. The whole Russia hoax story, for instance, over the last four years, we've watched that story significantly develop in terms of, of bits of information and what we've learned and what the FBI knew at one point and Christopher Steele and the guy who wrote the dossier. There's so much information that's come out over time that where you end up four years later is nowhere near where you started four years before. But as that happens, any good journalist would say, it's not that my previous stories were lies. It's that my previous stories were based upon the information I had at the time, and then that changes over time. And I think that's what's missing from this whole fact check thing. But certainly on the issue of masks, that's, a, that's an issue that, where you don't even have to go far because I did two stories on it. My initial story on it was flagged as being false and untrue. And the claim was that the data that was used was based on old data. They use the term old, meaning studies between 2010 and 2020. That's not old in terms of science. It's not old in terms of looking at, at face masks. The face masks have really not changed between 2015, 2017, or 2020. So I went back and I responded to it, and I took a brand new study that was done in May of this year, published by the CDC in May of this year, and was done for and prepared for the WHO specific to this pandemic. And that study found the exact same three principles that we laid out in the first one. Number one, that masks, there is no evidence that they prevent the spread of a virus. Number two, that a cloth mask can actually make you sick by wearing it because of the fact that you're constantly touching your face and most people don't know how to apply it tight enough to, to prevent virus from getting in. So you're actually making yourself more susceptible. And then the, the other issue with it is that people who have other health conditions find that that wearing a mask can be detrimental in terms of those other health conditions. So that study from May of 2020, so it was less than 60 days old, essentially showed the exact same thing, and they labeled that one as being false also. So, Ben, I, and I want to go straight to the censorship to see if we can go kind of to the bottom of the rabbit hole a little bit faster here, because you would think... I mean, if you're if you're in a, a friendly family conversation and one person says, well, shut up, poopy face. I don't want to listen to you at all. They kind of they're kind of admitting that they've lost the argument. Sure. You know, they, and it's like, wait, well, why are we letting government do this now with censorship? Like, is this not something that do, do, does the average American not know that? your stories are being censored. And I don't mean you in particular, because there are a lot yeah. of great voices doing work. There are a sure. lot of great independent journalists who are actively challenging this narrative and similarly getting censored. Uh, like, it, it, it's, are they losing credibility at any deeper level here? I think they are. I really do think that, that certainly social media companies are losing credibility through this. Because as you said, it's lots of journalists, but let's go beyond journalists. Let's go just to the average, you know, Jane or Joe in America, who takes a picture and shares a picture, and that gets flagged as false news. And, and I, this actually happened to me as well, which was there was a photograph of a paper that was put up at an Ace Hardware in Michigan in response to the Governor Gretchen Whitmer's rule that, said, that basically threatened businesses and said, everyone must wear a mask. And if you allow someone into your business who's not wearing a mask, then right. you can face Let me, let me the guess, this is the one license. that said, if... If we were, if you come in without a mask, we assume that you have a health issue and you're exempt, yeah. and we will welcome you, right? That's that's all it said. It basically was it was a workaround, right? Saying we're not gonna we're not gonna ask based on HIPAA laws. That picture was flagged as being misleading or false information. You say, well, wait a minute, why, why is this false? So a fact checker would say, is the picture real? 
Was it really put up in an Ace hardware? Was this used to get around the mask rule? That's what fact checking is. That's not what they did. They say it's fake because they say this does not violate HIPAA laws. So, wait a minute. You were in fact checking the the picture. You fact checked the information inside the flyer that was in an Ace hardware. No, no, no. In a sense, that's true, right? That HIPAA specifically applies in certain situations, but this is a medical, they're saying this is a medical privacy issue. And that's, but, but the thing is, you can't take a picture of someone else being wrong. Right. Right. I mean, that's, exactly. that's the implication of this. Like you can't, we can't even look around America right now and go, how many people are wrong about something because that's being censored in and of itself. I mean, that's, it, it, right. that, that's, I, I hate to, to invoke the cliche, but isn't that Orwellian? Oh, it, it absolutely is. Look, what you're essentially saying is it's like thought police, right? You can't even think about something that we disagree with. So when someone puts up this picture, right? The, the debate in America was not over whether or not HIPAA laws apply. The debate was over the fact that you had business owners saying, we will not comply with your rules because we don't agree with them. Here's how we're going to get around your threat to us, governor, your threat of shutting down our business or locking our doors or taking our business license. That's what the picture was about. But what they did was they say, because this is untrue, it becomes, these are their words, harmful and misleading information. And so what's happening is we're watching, and this is very Orwellian, uh, this concept of saying, anytime someone says something that's wrong or untrue, this poses a either physical, emotional, um, you know, or medical, that's the term I'm looking for, medical threat to the larger population, which is insane. It's not true. But this is, this is the psychology of what's being done on social media. We're trying to protect you from the bad people who are trying to hurt you. And so it's the same concept that we've seen with, with um, the playbook for guns for years, right? We have to control whether you have a gun because it's not about you having the right to own a gun. It's about protecting all the people out there who could be harmed when someone bad gets it. Well, they're using the same playbook here, which is we've got to protect you as the general public from the bad people out there who are saying bad and dangerous things could, that could lead to your harm. But here's the problem, Adam, is that when that happens, you're now assuming the answer, right? Which is that we know everything about this virus and we know what's harmful. And so when you have like a group of doctors, like the, the America's frontline doctors who came out last week and they're talking about hydri, uh, hydri, what is it? hydroxychloroquine and you start talking about that, in public and that all gets pulled down. Look, maybe those doctors are wrong. Maybe they're absolutely confused about what they're talking about. But when doctors are saying, this is what we believe is the answer, let's discuss it and debate it. In in any kind of, of critical thinking society, you say, we need discussions about what to do. The answer cannot be, we have no idea about this virus, so lock everything down until we get a vaccine. And when we get the right vaccine, we'll pump it into you and we'll hope that that works. That can't be the only answer. So Ben, I get the feeling that when we're arguing about masks and mask science and we're getting censored on that, we're missing the point, that yeah. we're, we're being tricked. We're, we're falling for some general diversion scheme because we shouldn't be arguing the si- we're not scientists as a journalist you're not a scientist nope. as a libertarian as an activist i'm not a scientist and, and you know dr mary ruer when i interviewed her she said you know uh, businesses there that everybody's got to set their policy for themselves got to be responsible for their own health and it was that great hey i'm not going to tell you what to do kind of answer but right now, have we given up the bigger ground, uh, the, the bigger fight that's more important of, hey, n- no health crisis, no matter what the science is, an excuse for you to violate my rights as an individual or anybody else? Right. Yeah, th- I think that's that's the main point of all of this, right? And you're absolutely right. right. Look, it's important for people to realize, like, I don't care if people wear masks. I'm not anti-mask. If you choose to wear a mask, that's absolutely your choice. And, and not only that, if you have a conviction, you believe this will protect you, then by all means, wear your mask. The problem is, is that the push for masks coming down from governors and from mayors and being forced on businesses doesn't feel like... 
it has anything to do with health or science. And that was the only point I was trying to make with the stories was let's look at the science because if science is not settled on this, and clearly it is not, is not settled about whether or not this protects you, why is there such a heavy demand? Last week, the state of Indiana sent down a, or passed a new law saying if you don't wear a mask in public, you face six months in jail and a $1,000 fine. That's nuts. You're going to put people in prison for six months if they don't wear a mask in public? And Where they're then, of course, there was such an outcry, they back down. Yeah, so, they, ba uh, they backed down from it because there was such an outcry. But the, the fact is... For those who choose not to wear a mask, that should also be their choice, right? And and here's what's really important is that if you're wearing a mask and I'm not wearing one, how is that putting you at risk? You're not more at risk if I'm not wearing a mask because the point of wearing the mask is to prevent you from contracting this this virus, right? Well, well, well hold on, hold on. You, a couple things, couple things here, Ben. Before you finish that point, I, if if I may, like the the, the sure. pro mask people will say. You're limiting the projection of, of your uh, potential particulate, uh, you know, spittle or or whatever that has got the virus. But also the thing about masks, like I'm 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 with you in the sense that I, I respect people's right to wear a mask, but I'm against it. Like unless you have a specific reason, no. Yes, like I respect your right to be wrong, but I'm still sure. against you being wrong. And I think at this point, wearing a mask in any way proactively is is actually contributing to the hysteria i mean maybe in an insignificant way and and you know where i live in arizona it's different even from store to store in the same town but when you sure. see other people in the store not wearing a mask it's like yeah i see you yeah you're the one who's not yeah we get it we're not we're we're not zombies and we're helping other people see that they don't being a zombie is optional right now right yeah, look, I, but again, I, if, I think if people choose to wear them, look, there's a report of a guy who, who had a collapsed lung because he tried to you know jog for 2.6 miles with a mask on and his lung collapsed, right? There are reports of, of kids in schools in China where they are wearing masks while doing PE who are getting sick, right? There's, I think the science, again, shows that this is not wise, but I think people have the, have the right to make unwise choices for themselves. The problem com comes with this is the mandate, is the mandate that says sure. it doesn't matter if you believe that this is not good for you, you will comply. And so it's about compliance. I, I think that the mask situation is about creating compliance across the board and forcing the public that when we tell you to do something, you will do it. It doesn't matter what we've said in the past. And that's Orwellian, right? It doesn't matter that three months ago, the WHO said, don't wear masks. It doesn't matter that three months ago, studies were showing that this is bad for you because today we're telling you, you must. And the moment we say you must, then you must. So it becomes about compliance and it, bec it really becomes about uh, requiring you to do what we tell you and I think a lot of this is less about coronavirus and more about training the public to behave in a certain way beyond coronavirus, beyond viruses and pandemics, so that whenever government sends down an edict, you will respond. And I think there are a lot of folks who are taking notes right now saying what works, what doesn't work, and how do we continue to get compliance? What are the, the, the words that are used, the, the strategies that are used to actually get compliance? Yeah, it's got to be a great social experiment for those people playing with the levers. So just before we get to your big answer to this with ISE.media, what's your take on the threat of the virus itself and what is your personal mask policy? Okay, so in terms of uh, the kind of view of the virus itself. So the virus, obviously, I believe is a very real thing. I don't think it's a fake virus. Um, I do believe, based on the research I've done and the stories that I've done, um, that there has been work done to alter coronaviruses. That's a fact. It was being done in the United States. It's a fact that in 2014, funding for that particular program, sorry, 2013, for that particular program was cut off to the NIH. The NIH uh, then turned around and outsourced it to a company called Ally uh, Echo Alliance, who then took that same study and moved it to six labs in China, including the Wuhan vi Virology Lab. The goal at the time, and there's been a number of articles about this back in 2013, 2014, and 2015 that talked about the wisdom or lack thereof of attempting to alter a SARS 
like coronavirus in order to better attach to humans. Remember in 2002 when, when the SARS pandemic that wasn't hit, the reason it, it self-eradicated in a few months is that the SARS coronavirus could not attach to human cells very well. That's why very few people died from it and it self-eradicated in just a few months. It couldn't, it couldn't attach to human cells. There was work done, and again, this is all like public knowledge, and we've done reports on this, that in uh, 2014, 2013, th there were studies being done to try to alter those SARS coronavirus um, cells to better attach to human cells. But when it stopped, it got outsourced. So I believe that there is no question in my mind, and by the way, there's a number of, of scientists and virologists from outside this country, including in Australia, where some of the top um, vaccine developers there who are doctors looked at this coronavirus when they were trying to, to map it for vaccine and said, this is not a naturally occurring coronavirus. This has been altered. So I believe that when you look now, you know, just by saying that you get censored because, well, the WHO has announced that it's not been altered. Yeah, the WHO makes lots of pronouncements all the time. But there are virologists who were looking at this disease saying there's something different about this that indicates it is not naturally occurring. And the spike proteins in it do not look like they're naturally occurring. So I believe there was work being done with this. Um, I don't know how it got out, whether it was intentional, accidental, um, but it, it appears it did come from that Wuhan virology lab. But I also believe that it is not near as deadly as it's being made out to be. And one of the reasons for that is because the numbers are so poor in terms of actual deaths. We know for a fact that in New York, they added, what, 3,000 people to their to their numbers just by declaring them de coronavirus deaths without a test being done. San Antonio, Texas had their health department remove 3,000 cases that they had, they had uh, listed. They had to remove it because they admitted that, well, we never actually tested anyone. And then we just released a report last week about the fact that all across the country, people are saying they're getting phone calls from clinics telling them you have coronavirus based on your test, but they never took a test. They just signed up yeah. at a clinic and then they left because the lines were long. So the numbers in terms of information are so skewed, Adam, that we don't even know how many people have had it. We don't know how many people have actually died from it. We know that in Florida, a guy died in a motorcycle crash and was listed as a coronavirus death until a local yeah. TV station found out about it. And then they took his name out. So if you mention that, by the way, going back to the social media thing, if you mention that, on social media, they'll flag you as false information that was changed. It's not that it's false information. They said it at one point, and when they were caught doing this, they reversed course. That's essentially what happened. So, Ben, the last thing that uh, we got to cover is what's your long-term answer to this? Because obviously this is a battle for for information. I hate, I hate to use that branding from Alex Jones, but he was really brilliant to, to call it info wars, right? I mean, this yeah. is, this is where it's at. And that like the, the, the practice of journalism in, in the way that you do it. And, and, and I mean, I consider myself more of an activist, maybe activist journalist, but still as a way of conveying information is so important right now. Tell us about ISE.media and your longer term optimism. Yeah, absolutely. So um, ISE.media is a platform that we are creating we're actually doing an equity crowdfunding right now to try to build it up. But the goal is to create a rifle to Facebook and YouTube in terms of a streaming channel that allows for content creators to come there and not be censored in the content that they're putting out. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build a channel system where, where each content creator has their own channel. They're able to go on there and they can, they can talk about what they want to talk about and they're not going to get censored because there has to be a response. There has to be a response uh, to what is taking place here. Social media companies have made the decision that you're not allowed to talk about the things that they deem uh, unworthy of speech. And so that's what we're attempting to build. Long term, what we want to do is we want to create a system. And by the way, I want to say this too. When, when, you know, you were saying you're more of an activist, but one thing that social media did do that was positive is it created a system by which you didn't have to be a professional journalist to share information. You didn't have to be a professional journalist to be able to, to find documents or find uh, reports or find photographs or videos and share that with the rest of the world. That's an act of journalism, right? And so social media started to create a new world of journalism 
And because it was so successful in creating a new world of journalism, in 2016, we suddenly saw groups like the Atlantic Council and Media Matters and, and you know Soros' groups come in and shut all of that down because they were terrified of what was happening. There was a revolution, a, a, a journalistic revolution, um, a revolution of critical thinking beginning to take place and form on social media. And that is being disappeared just as fast as it grew in the first place. And now you watch what's happening, like even as we're talking here, this situation with TikTok. So TikTok, this Chinese company, and I don't, I'm not a fan of, of TikTok or ByteDance, the company that owns them. But the fact that now Trump has pushed for uh, Microsoft to buy them and has given 45 days he's going to ban it unless Microsoft buys them. So Microsoft is now trying to acquire and buy TikTok. And when you think about that, how insane is that? So now Microsoft that hasn't even, even been in the social media game will now suck up another and absorb another successful social media company, which will then add all those same restrictions. And as I said before about those America's frontline doctors, what we saw last week was a coordinated effort. They said something that is not permitted right now. And so YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, and Facebook all on the same day removed every single video. That's a coordinated what, what effort tell, to shut down. What does it tell you that, that the president sharing that was still able, didn't stop it from being squashed. Well, I, I, it's, it's, it makes no sense at all. I mean, the president is doing this, I think, because he's afraid that if he gets rid of TikTok, there'll be backlash to it. But the fact that this is the same president who keeps talking about tech censorship, and he keeps saying that there's a problem, but now you're actually encouraging the more of it, you're more of the consolidation, more of the same. No, no, no. no. I mean, the, the frontline doctors video itself, Trump and oh, I'm Don. Go ahead. What? Yeah, no, Trump, the, the, the frontline doctors video itself, Trump shared that. Yeah. And social media still killed it. I mean, yes. you, it, it, is it, I mean, I'm kind of a separate question here than like what, what, like, I, the way I've described this is that the left, the media, the Democrats, the, the left wing of the American Socialist Party, the Democrats, as opposed to the right wing of the American yeah. Socialist Party, the Republicans, set a, <laughs> a trap for Donald Trump, and he walked right into it. Yeah. And then, you know, he, he, he thought he could have one foot out, and he came, he tried to step out on the other foot and slipped on a banana peel named George Floyd. And then, and, and now he's, he's had, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if he pulled something out of his sleeve at the last minute, but, you know, he's, he's kind of, seems very set up for failure for re-election here. Um, yeah. is, 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 is there really this, this opposition here? What, what is Trump's role in all this? I, I want to point out to Republicans and Trump supporters, you can't give him any credit here. He's the one who declared the national state of emergency. At, at, I mean, at, at best, he's, be, he's allowing himself to be bullied to go along with all yeah. of it. See, and, and that's part of the problem is that, is that uh, Trump is in a position where he's watching his poll numbers slip. And because his poll numbers are down, he's, he's now reacting to those poll numbers being down by going along with and trying to sound like everyone else. He made the statement himself the other day. He says, Fauci is saying to do all these things and Fauci has really high poll numbers and I have really low poll numbers and I guess they just don't like my personality. And it was actually a pretty funny moment. But what I think the mistake that the president is making is he should own what he's been saying. He should own it and say, we need to get the country running again. You got to get people back to work. You got to allow people to open their businesses at their own risk if they choose to do so. But but forcing them to be shut down and be bullied, you use the word bullied. That's exactly what I think is happening. Be bullied into this position where essentially you don't care about the public. The reality is we have people who, and we're going to have an enormous uh, set of ramifications in terms of health in this country lowered immune systems, people who have missed cancer screenings, who have not been able to get joint replacements. Um, Suicide, you know, depression, anxiety, all the mental absolutely. health. Absolutely. Suicide is going to be a huge issue down. when you don't have it people who are allowed to work. I, by the way, I would, I would, I, I, you know, I cover more like daily news stories and do interviews, but I would love to see, I, you know, I, one of these things I'm kind of waiting and I to see a, a good analysis. And I'd love, I'd love for that to be the topic you tackle, tackle next in depth is to look at the, you know, is the cure worse than the disease? Just measuring okay. the costs of the cure and suicide. Uh, some of the stories that I've already seen, you know, it's, it's kind of limited data, but we have pretty 
definitive data in limited circumstances in areas where doctors are seeing more suicide than corona patients. And we just yeah, it's, it's, it's an enormous problem. And the fact is, it's not going to get better. It's actually getting worse. When you are now talking about shutting down the country until the end of the year, that's now the new, uh, you know, a goalpost is the end of the year, another four, five, six months. Is that what we're talking about? You're telling me that business owners can stay closed for four or five or six months? No, you're putting people permanently out of work. You're robbing them of, of what they have saved for and attempted to build. And that's why I think there is a, a real libertarian moment that could come out of this, Adam, a real right. moment where somebody stands up and says, no, we're not gonna do it this way. In Germany, in Berlin, Germany, over the weekend, millions of people, the, the, you know, the media said 17,000 people showed up. Look at the pictures. There are now reports it was between 1.7 million to 3 million people who came out to protest lockdowns there. The media said it was all conspiracy theorists. Really? That's a lot of conspiracy theorists to turn out into the streets and say, we're not going to wear masks. We want, and this is the words they were using, we want democracy back. Meaning we want the consent of the governed to be what runs the country. Not not some uh, edict from on high that tells us what to do, what to think, and what to believe. Okay, America, did you hear that? Germany is ahead of us on standing up to their government on this one right now. I covered the story today. I saw that number 17,000 and was like, you're, even that is amazing. We have not had that in the United no. States yet. We haven't, so but, fast, but, but look at the pictures. In fact, I released a report on it today and we have, and we have pictures and video from it. If you look at those pictures, that is not 17,000 people. The, the, the people who are out there, it's, it's absolutely stunning. It, it, it dwarfs the protests over Black Lives Matter. And I, and I think they're legit, those are legitimate protests in some ways, right? Not, not all of them, the Antifa guys destroying stuff, no. But there have been legitimate protests there to say, we wanna change policing. And you know, Adam, I've been talking about policing for years and the fact that there needs to be reform there. But media has covered that breathlessly, right? They have covered the protests that when 50,000 people showed up in Los Angeles, they covered it breathlessly. Go look at the pictures of what just took place in Berlin and see if they even mention it on CNN. They won't. They're terrified of this idea coming to the U.S. Wrong narrative. Wrong narrative for their, their agenda. All right. So, Ben, please, back to ISC Media. Where's the... I mean, I've, I've been saying for a long time, like, we've got to get to some kind of decentralized social media. We've got to get to some kind of alternative. And I, I've seen a lot of people take a stab at, you know, establishing something new. It's an uphill fight, man. What's, what's the edge yes. in your model? Yeah, so it is an uphill fight, but what we're trying to do is create ultimately a decentralized platform. That is the goal. And so by utilizing, you know, this equity crowdfunding model, what we're trying to do is not have it be a top-down situation, but we bring in hundreds and then thousands of owners into this company, people who have a, a vested interest in it and actually can help to shape it. Because here's what we don't want to see. We don't want to see the attempt at creating basically a new platform that then gets acquired at some point by some big media company and instead create something that's owned by the people uh, who then through this kind of um, community are able to say, well, this is how we want the company to look. This is how we want to steer it. This is how we want to shape it. And I think that's so important because I think I have great intentions. I know I do, but even my great intentions are not good enough. That's one person having strong intentions. But if you can get a, a community of people who are thinking the same way, a community of people who are demanding with different, by the way, interests, different points of view, different belief systems, but the thing they would have in common is we think people have the right to speak. And as we talked about in the beginning, even if that means being wrong, you have the right to be wrong in this society because if we take that away, you're not taking away people's right to be wrong. You're taking away their right to be right. Couldn't have said it better myself, Ben. I've I've always been a big fan. <clears throat> excuse me, a big fan of your methodology of journalism, and I'm I'm honored to have your time and your input and understanding what we're facing today. And uh, I'm looking forward to supporting this. I'm looking forward to getting our content out there as well. Always looking for new platforms. Absolutely. I have a, I have I have a lot of faith in your intent. Although you never know what we're up against, but the more people who join, the more people who put momentum behind a project like this, the more likely it is to succeed and overcome these challenges. 
it's about time. You know, one of these attempts at overthrowing the mainstream media and the mainstream social media platforms, at some point it has to succeed. We have to realize the potential of the technology that we have. I'm honored to be able to call you a friend and a colleague. Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. Any last thoughts or other things that you want people to know to be able to connect with you? Yeah, ch check out ISE.media. And then, of course, you can go to my social and see what you can while you're there because they keep bl uh, blocking things. But I was just going to say, Adam, I can't wait to get the platform to where, the level where we're bringing on content creators and we have you as one of those content creators. I'm really looking forward to that. I'll be right there. Ben Swan, thank you so much for joining us today.